Ah. How did I get into this mess? But far enough. You can't run forever, Mr. Phoenix Wright. What have I done wrong? I cannot allow you to go on like this. Huh? But, but I'm just a simple defense attorney. Silence! You are no longer worthy of your title. Well... Oh, wait. I've had this dream before. Some place some time ago, as if this day was written into my destiny. Today I'll stand in court as a lawyer to prove a killer innocent. Again, as I said in the last episode during my rant, being a lawyer is a soulless job, but someone's got to do it. Unfortunately. Anyway, Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. I will just leave it at that as an intro because, because we already spent like a minute and a half with that dream sequence. That's far enough. Or we could, okay, there we go. <laughs> it's like a long wait. Hello? This is Phoenix Wright. You don't look so well, dude. You're gonna prove me not guilty today, right? <laughs> if you please, Mr. Lawyer. Remember, it's not just me. Your precious friend's life is riding on today's verdict, too. Now listen up. You better get on guard a guilty sentence, okay? If you get that creepy slime bag and not guilty, I'll never forgive you. Ever. Maya. Phoenix? Phoenix? M M Mia! Oh, I took a guess and it actually was Mia, wow. M Maya! How's Maya? I don't know. Y you don't know? She hasn't tried to channel me since yesterday. Mia? Wh uh, what am I supposed to do? Well, like I said, for a lawyer, the worst of times are when you have to force your biggest smiles. B but you can't give up. There's still some hope left. Stop it, please. There's nothing left. Not here, not anywhere, Mia. That stupid on guard again. Will you leave me alone? Look, don't call me anymore. I mean it. You're really mean, pal. Oh, oh, g g g gumshoe. Uh, uh. Sorry, sorry, I, I, I really, really sorry. Where, where, where are you? Well, let me join the investigation team, and we're chasing after the killer pile. Th then, that means you had some sort of lead? Sorry, but right now we got zero leads on the guy. But, we're not gonna give up. Come sh- come shoe. Until the trial's over, until the verdict's handed down, we're gonna do everything we can and find the killer. If we can get Maya out, then you can get Ungar the Guilty Bar like he deserves, pile. That, that's true. I could do that if they found Maya first. You got that? So you have to do whatever you can to make sure the trial lasts longer. I have to make the trial last longer? Well, if you go at Mr. Edgeworth with everything you've got, then the two of you can draw it out. Oh, now I get it. I believe in you, pile. You and Mr. Edgeworth can do it. So, so believe in us. We're gonna give it our all, just like you. Got it. Thanks, Gumshoe. I don't know why all of a sudden I couldn't remember how to do Gumshoe's voice, so now he's got he's got this like country slangish thing going on. <laughs> hey, Phoenix, you understand now, don't you? You have something money will never be able to buy: friendship. It's the strongest weapon in the world, and you have it in abundance. Yeah. Looks like we're coming to the end. I have to make the trial last as long as I can. Gumshoe will come through, I know it. Pray to God he does, because we are out of time today. 
Oh boy, we- as he said, we are coming towards the end, folks. We are coming towards the inevitable end. Court is now in session for the trial of Mr. Mat Ungard. The defense is ready, Your Honor. The prosecution has been ready for a while, Your Honor. Now, as I recall, we concluded yesterday's session with a big mystery on our hands. The mystery being, what exactly was Miss Adrian Andrews' role in this murder? That is to say, is she really connected to the crime itself? Mr. Edgeworth, if you will please inform the court of today's proceedings. Adrian Andrews. He forged evidence that threw suspicion onto Mr. Ungard. And then proceeded to escape the crime scene by wearing a nickel samurai costume. The guilt of these actions are from are the ugh. the guilt of these actions are those from which she cannot escape. Hmm. So you're saying that she is guilty after all? I am not finished, Your Honor. Miss Andrews has nothing to do with committing the actual murder. What? I would like to direct the court's attention to this card. And what is that? It looks like a shell. This is the calling card of a certain assassin. Uh, assassin, you say? Game? <laughs> My game keeps doing a freeze every moment. <laughs> yes, one corridor was killed by a professional assassin. And the person who hired the assassin, his client, so to speak, is Matt Ungard. W well, what a surprising turn of events. I would think it's become commonplace by now, Your Honor. I know what's going on this time. Though I know that everything Edgeworth has said is true. But we still have to hold out as long as we can. At least until Maya's safe and sound. I wonder how the trial will turn out today. Now then, please call your first witness, Mr. Edgeworth. The prosecution calls the defendant's mentor, Mr. Will Powers, to the stand. Now then, witness. Your name and occupation, please. O okay. I'm... I'm Will Powers. I'm a poor, underpaid action star. And what is your relation to the defendant? Well, that... I guess I'm sort of a lousy mentor to him in a way. Yeah. Um... Mr. Powers, please. You don't need to put yourself down so much. Oh, uh, sorry. Well, but I'm just kind of a nothing sort of guy. On the night of the murder, you visited the defendant's room. Is this correct? Uh, yes. What? I didn't know that. Uh, but, you know, I didn't actually get to see Matt when I went. All you need to do is answer what you're asked. Now then. I would like you to please testify about when you went to Mr. Ungard's room. Okay, sure. <laughs> oh, here we go. Hopefully my voice can hold out for mi Mr. Powers, because I have, like, super deep. <laughs> like, the deepest that I can make. Ooh. After the award ceremony, I went by myself to Matt's room. Matt was standing there in front of his room, still in his nickel samurai costume. He was talking with someone. Uh, at first, I thought it was the bellboy. I watched the two of them for a while, but then I gave up and went back. I had guests with me that night, and I couldn't make them wait for me. Hmm. Nothing sounds out of place in Mr. Powers' testimony. And talking with the bellboy is no big deal. If one assumes that the person Mr. Ungard was speaking with was an ordinary bellboy... What are you implying, Mr. Edgeworth? Well, Mr. Wright, let's have your cross-examination, shall we? Looks like we're in another sticky situation. Huh? A trap. Can't you smell it, Phoenix? But for us to find out more, we're just gonna have to charge in head first, right? Yep. I think it's clear that he, Ungar was talking not to the bellboy, but to, but to De Keller. Well, after the award ceremony, I went by myself to Matt's room. The defendant's room? Why'd you go there? Well, I'm his mentor, like a big brother, sort of, and I wanted to say congrats. What's wrong? Why'd you stop, Mr. Powers? 
B -b Mr. Rot? W what is it? You... You're going to try and trick me into a quarter, aren't you? Huh? I, I know I'm just a poor underpaid action star, but... But I... I'm not a killer! Uh... No one said you were, Mr. Powers. No, please! Don't trick me! Every time you do your lawyer thing, the witness suddenly turns into the bad guy. Every time? Witness. I will personally talk to the defense at a later time. So for now, please kindly cooperate and continue with your testimony. S sorry. So, you went back to the defendant's room. And then? Hey, 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 wait a minute. When and how did I suddenly turn into the bad guy here? Mott was standing there in front of his room, still in his Nickel Samurai costume. That is not what I wanted. Are you sure that was Matt Ungard? Yeah, I'm sure. He wasn't wearing the Nickel Samurai mask then. If that's the case, then he really can't be mistaken. And? What was the defendant doing standing in front of his own room? He was talking with someone. At first I thought it was the bellboy. Oh my god, I keep pressing the wrong button. At first? What do you mean by that? Well, he was in a bellboyish uniform, and he had a bottle of juice on a tray. Sounds like an ordinary bellboy to me. Um, yeah, but... I didn't think he was a normal bellboy. And why was that, Mr. Powers? Um, why did I think that, Mr. Wright? Uh, how am I supposed to know? Sorry, but I can't remember right now. Sorry. <sighs> I guess I'm gonna have to wait patiently on this one. I watched the two of them for a while, but then I gave up and went back. You saw the two of them, the bellboy and the defendant together, correct? Yeah, the bellboy just wanted to say congrats. Now, while you were watching the two of them, did you notice anything strange? Um, you know, I did feel something weird. I think it was because Matt, well, he gave the bellboy a tip. A tip? But that's a perfectly normal thing to do. So, how long did you watch the two of them? Uh, not more than a minute or two, I think. I had guests with me at that night, so I couldn't make them wait for me. So who are these guests you're talking about? <laughs> you guys, of course. You and Maya and Little Pearl. I thought it would be really rude since I invited you guys if I disappeared on you. So I went back to my seat pretty soon after seeing Matt in the hallway. This is like squeezing water from a stone. It's probably pointless to press further. Do you remember this incident? Did Mr. Powers leave his seat that night? I honestly don't remember that happening at all. Maya was making such a racket in her hyper state. I ended up focusing on her. I see. In any case, from his story, he probably wasn't gone for very long. Arr, la 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 la. Well, I think I know, uh... Contradiction. I mean, not contradiction, and an addition. Here he said he gave the bellboy a tip, but he didn't express why it was strange. So let me press here again. Said he was talking to, and at first he thought it was a bellboy. At first. What do you mean by that? Oh, I didn't think it was a normal bellboy. And why was that? Um, why did I think that, Mr. Wright? How am I supposed to know? Hey, wait a second, that's what I thought. Actually, Mr. Powers, only a few minutes ago, you stated... Um, you know, I did feel something weird. I think it was because Matt, well, he gave the bellboy a tip. Could it be that you felt something strange about the tip-giving incident itself? Oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> you really know your job, Mr. Wright. Hmm. Mr. Edgeworth. Yes, Your Honor? This bellboy, he wasn't an ordinary one, was he? Perhaps we should let the witness tell us. Very well. Mr. Powers, please amend your testimony. You mean about the bellboy, right? Mark gave the bellboy a tip. But what is unusual about the tip? Please explain. So he gave the bellboy a tip. What's strange about that? Ah, uh, well, you see, 
Matt's not a poor penny pincher like me. I was trying to figure out how much it was because the tip really shocked me. How much it was? But that's when something even more surprising happened. The bellboy was putting the tip he got in his pocket. And, and that's when I got my first good look at the guy's face. I was really shocked. Hmm. I'm afraid I don't quite follow at all, Mr. Powers. Sounds like he was surprised twice by this event. I wonder which of his shocking moments I should ask about. Uh... I, I think I know what his face was shocking about the face. Considering that we're under the impression this is... De Kellar. So, what I'm more curious about, because I have no idea whatsoever, is the tip. The defendant is a huge star. He can afford to give a generous tip, wouldn't you say? Oh, sure. But giving him that much was maybe a little too much, I think. A little too much? Would you please clarify for the court about how much would you say the defendant gave the bellboy? Honestly, I don't know. I can't even begin to guess. And why is that? Because he gave the bellboy a really, really fat roll of cash. A, a roll of cash? Oh, well, how interesting. That certainly was a very generous tip, wasn't it? A very fat roll of cash. That can hardly be called a tip, your honor. Hmm. The judge is beginning to look awfully suspicious of us. What can we possibly object on here? I mean, that is not a tip. That is clearly not a tip. You don't give a bellboy a roll of cash. Uh, well, we're supposed to extend this trial as much as we can, so... Objection! <laughs> The defendant is a superstar. That kind of tip is typical fare for people like him. Oh god, Phoenix, come on. Are you saying that all superstars are super spenders? If I could receive large rolls of cash by simply bringing people things on trays, then why on earth would I stand around here prosecuting? <laughs> He's got a point. I don't even get paid, let alone rolls of cash for all my hard work. Hmm. So, supposing the roll of cash was not a tip, then what was it? Payment, your honor. Payment. Isn't it obvious? For the murder of Mr. Juan Correda. Then... Oh, then the bellboy the witness saw. Yes, he was the assassin. Oh, hold your horses now! Mr. Edgeworth, you don't have any proof of this, do you? Have I ever been unprepared to support my claims, Your Honor? I have here the card Shelley de Calar left at the scene of the crime. Sh Shelley de Calar? He is the person the police's special investigations team has been chasing for ages. I am certain that the person the witness saw was this very assassin, Shelley de Calar. Really? What's wrong, Mr. Powers? No, nothing. Something just clicked in my head, and I think I just figured something out. Oh? Actually, I saw that middle boy again later on that night. What? Mr. Powers, please, testify. Tell us about what you saw. Yes, sir. Right away. Great. This time, I was in that hallway because I had to go to the bathroom. And that's when that bellboy I saw earlier came out of the room. Of course, when I say room, I mean Juan Corrida's room. Now that I think about it, that bellboy did seem kinda out of place. Yeah, so he had to be the assassin, I'm sure of it. I mean... Thank you very much. That is all we need for now. Huh? But I'm not done. There's still more... Let us first establish that the bellboy was truly Mr. de Kellel. Then, we shall see. Hmm. So, the bellboy came out of the victim's room. And if that bellboy really was the assassin, then I think the answer is fairly obvious. That would be correct, your honor. Well, Mr. Wright, I believe it's your turn to entertain and make us laugh. <laughs> this is no laughing matter.
Here we go! This time, I was in that hallway because I had to go to the bathroom. And what time was it? Ah, uh, well, I don't remember. The award ceremony ended around 8, right? And I went to Mark's room pretty soon after that. And then I came back. Then I went into the bathroom. So I guess it was around 8.10 by that time. You're not one for details, are you, Mr. Powers? Sorry. I thought I could maybe catch Matt and say my congrats. And that's when that bellboy I saw earlier came out of the room. Are you sure it was the same bellboy? Oh, lords. Yeah. Yeah. And how could you tell? All the bellboys wear the same uniform after all. But, you see, well, he had those stitches in his face. Ugh. So I'm sure it's the same guy that was talking with Matt. Hmm. So which room did the bellboy come out of? Of course, when I say room, I mean Juan Corita's room. Oh my god. The victim's room, huh? Yeah, the one with all the really pretty flowers and teddy bears. It was Juan's room, alright. Words cannot describe how screwed I am. Heh. <laughs> Let's continue with the testimony, shall we? Now that I think about it, that bellboy did seem kinda out of place. Um, so what exactly was so out of place about him? Right, right, right. Why the insipid grin? Maybe because I have no idea what damaging thing he's gonna say next? Um, well, the bellboy was empty-handed. Empty-handed? Well, that bellboy was one of those room service people, right? But he wasn't pushing a cart, and he wasn't holding a tray either. You'd call that a little strange too, wouldn't you? Hmm. I must agree that it is a bit strange, Mr. Powers. But is it really that unusual for a bellboy to be empty-handed? What should I do? Should I let Mr. Powers' testimony slide, or...? Uh, well, technically, I don't think it's all that strange. I mean... Remember in his previous testimony just now, he said that the killer was holding a bo bottle, a tray of juice, the tomato juice, I would assume. So if he went to Juan's room under the guise of giving room service of the juice, in that respect, it would make sense that he came out holding nothing. In that respect. There is nothing strange or unusual about an empty-handed bellboy. But, but there really, really is. There really, really isn't. If you two are done being school children, bellboys are for room service. There is no reason for them to be empty-handed, ever. Your Honor, I ask that the witness's previous statement be supplanted with this new one. And what? Are you going to do whatever you can to make the bellboy look suspicious? I see. Very well, this court recognizes and grants the prosecution's request. Mr. Powers, if you could please amend your testimony, please. Uh, yes, sir. I thought it was kind of strange for the bellboy to come out of a guest room empty-handed. So, you're saying that it's suspicious for him to be empty-handed? Yeah, really suspicious. I mean, when I first saw that bellboy, he was holding a tray in his hand, and there was a bottle of juice and a wine glass on it. Juice? What kind of juice was it? Um, I'm pretty sure it was tomato juice. If we could come up with some sort of reason as to why he would come out empty-handed, some sort of proof, then I think we can dodge the bullet on this one for now. Proof, huh? Sounds like another job for the court record. Yeah, so he had to be the assassin, I'm sure of it. Please don't be so quick to judge. Oh, uh, but it's kind of a Powers family thing. <laughs> Think of every person as a thief. Well, I guess a, little, a thief and an assassin are both sneaky and silent. That's not the point, Phoenix. In any case, if that bellboy was the assassin, it would be very bad for us. But he really is, you know? Yes. But... You can't give in yet. If you want to prolong this trial for as long as possible, you're going to have to pull some cheap tricks on this one. And I think I know where the cheap trick is. Right here. 
I thought the bellboy coming out empty-handed was strange. Well, if he was coming out of Juan's room, we have tomato juice in there. If we're gonna pretend that the Keller is not the assassin, ugh, that, yeah. Okay, if we're gonna pretend that the bellboy is just the bellboy, we need this. Mr. Powers. Yes? You're easily influenced by other people's words, aren't you? As soon as you heard that the bellboy might have been the killer, you got caught up in believing it must be true. But, but, isn't he really suspicious? He's got all those stitches on, uh, on... So, a baseball has stitches? Are you saying that all baseballs are suspicious because they have stitches? <clears throat> well, there's also, I mean... What about him being empty-handed? I would like to ask the court to please take a look here. This, this is the crime scene. There is a wine glass sitting next to Mr. Corita's body. The liquid inside this glass is tomato juice. And now, if you would take a look at what is on the top of the table in the lower right corner here. Anyone can clearly see that it's a tray with a bottle of tomato juice on it. The bellboy had just brought this to Mr. Corita's room. He left the tray in the room, which is why he was empty-handed when he left. Oh, but, but that would mean that the bellboy had seen and left the dead body in the room. Ah, but can you prove that Mr. Corita was already dead at the time? Oh, Mr. Ledgeworth. Yes? Uh, yes. I blame you for leading me down this route. <laughs> oh, I'm terribly sorry. What is with him? Why is he laughing? Witness, isn't there one more thing you would like to share with us? Uh, is there? The bellboy was empty-handed. Or should I say, empty-handed. I recall you had something interesting to say about his hands. Oh yeah, I, I almost forgot. Huh? Wh what? Uh, that bellboy, he was wearing gloves. Gloves? Yeah, pitch black leather ones. All the other bellboys don't wear gloves like that, right? Black leather, black leather gloves. Why didn't you mention them earlier? Sorry, it slipped my mind. Ugh. Boy, does this make the bellboy look really suspicious. Alright, gotta focus. I can't get lax here. So, what if he had gloves? A lot of bellboys wear gloves. Oh, come on, Mr. Wright. That black... Ugh, that bellboy was wearing black leather ones. Ooh, boy. I almost made this into a race thing. The black bellboy. Oh, dear. Ooh. That would have been, that would have been bad. So, a football is made of leather. Are you saying that all footballs are suspicious because they're made of leather? Ooh. But that man, he received a large roll of cash from the defendant. And then he was seen leaving the crime scene wearing black leather gloves. I don't think that even someone like myself can believe he was just another bellboy. <clears throat> it seems that we have finally come to an understanding. Now then, witness, please continue with the rest of your testimony. The, the rest? Oh, yes. Please, tell us more. Okay. Uh, before we do that, I'm going to get a drink of water because all this deep voice talking is... I feel like my throat's going to get thrown out if I don't get a drink. So I'm going to stop, take a break, and be right back. Later, everyone. <laughs> 